Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. I'm Kevin Gastola, joined by Rania Kalik. Hey, Rania. Hello, Kevin. And we're very pleased for this show to be joined by Justin Podor, who is an academic and the author of Extraordinary Threat, the U.S. Empire, the Media, and 20 Years of Coup Attempts in Venezuela, among other books. So thanks for being a part of this week's episode. Thank you. I'll co- I should say co-author, right? With Joe Yeah, right. Oh, Emersberger. right. Let's also drop the name of your co-author, Joe yeah. Emersberger. Uh, we invited him on the show, but he had a work conflict. So hopefully we'll get to catch up with him at a later date. Uh, but to get right into it, I mean, I think, why don't you just set us up for our conversation by laying a, a foundation here for what you get into in the book and how you describe Venezuela, both of you describe Venezuela as an extraordinary threat. And let's let's maybe work backwards from where we are present day and, and get into some of the more latest developments. What's your view of uh, Biden administration's policy? How, how might you differentiate it or how might you contextualize it in this policy, which I think uh, you really point out accelerates and intensifies with the Obama administration and how it gets singled out as a national security threat to the United States in order for all these intelligence agencies as well as other parts of the government to kick into their regime change operations or the kind of imperialism uh, that is the focus of your book. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It's it's such a such an honor to be on your show. Both of you are uh, people whose work I, I follow every day, pretty much. So yeah, here I am. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> extraordinary threat. So the idea is, you know, the title, it comes from the fact that in order to apply sanctions to on a country, unilateral sanctions such as the US has on Venezuela, um, there's this there's this formality that that has to be gone through where the country is designated by the U as an extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. So that's just so ridiculous. The idea that Venezuela is an extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States that even when they reported it um, in the New York Times or whatever, they kind of say, you know, obviously we know that it's not a threat to the United States, but we um, we have to do this so that we can apply sanctions. So it's sort of like um, this, cer- you know, cer- the worst kind of circular reasoning. But that's the that's the just that's the reason we gave it that title. But that has a, a long history, right? Like Nicaragua was similarly designated back in I think the '80s, and there was this. They were trying to paint scenarios of Nicaraguans invading the U.S. through Mexico and and all kinds of scenarios like this. And the same goes for Venezuela. You may have seen maps of like the the idea that drugs are coming to the U.S. from Venezuela when they're coming actually from the U.S. allies, um, Colombia, and they're coming you know through in some cases through Haiti. Like it's all the territories that are actually under the control of the U.S. that are that are the drug. Um, you know, production and transshipment and all the rest of it. So uh, that's why extraordinary threat. So, okay. Um, Now, the next part is the US empire. Obviously, listeners know that the deal, the media, we wanted to spend a special time on both the media and um, the human rights uh, organization. So we have a we have a really um, deep critique, uh, focusing on human rights watch but also of the the whole human rights um, industry and the way that they, um, you know, use the fact that people think of them as a source of information on human rights violations everywhere. And in fact, they are a, a kind of a very biased regime, you know, wing of the regime change uh, propaganda. So they're constantly um, putting out information or in some cases fabrications about um, things that are going on in Venezuela uh, and ignoring and covering up and minimizing uh, things that are going on like right next door in Colombia, for example, or in Haiti, uh, or obviously things that the U.S. is doing in, for example, Afghanistan or Iraq um, or Israel. I mean, the way Human Rights Watch covers for Israel is a subject in itself, we we talk about that in the book too. And then 
20 years of coup attempts in Venezuela because that's that's has that's how long Chavismo has been in power, right? They they came to power in '98 um, in an election, and they've been you know they changed the constitution. They had all these uh, electoral tests, and from uh, from the beginning, the U.S. has been trying to overthrow them the way that the U.S. tries to overthrow left wing governments everywhere in the world all the time. Um, in that sense, it's not uh, that different in Venezuela, but Venezuela is a pretty powerful case because it's been they've survived right like cuba a couple of them are still standing and venezuela's survived this 20 years and as a result there's this incredibly long record of lies and of of sanctions and of all of the like the u.s has pulled every trick that they have um to try to overthrow venezuela there's been a, a coup several coup attempts they've sponsored uh you know demonstrations that were very violent to try to provoke responses. They've uh, enacted several strikes. Uh, they tried to shut down the whole oil industry. They invaded with mercenaries pretty recently. They did that aid stunt on the Colombian border. They've had, they've tried to create like a, a situation of tension on the Colombian border for decades. So uh, they've had paramilitary invasions from Colombia. So they've, they've done all their tricks. And um, so it's a good, case to see how the trick what the tricks are and it's a good it's a good way to study how the empire works in general by focusing on this case so that that's that was like what we were trying to do that's what we do in the book um we get into ne necessarily we end up having to get into some detail about venezuelan history and chavismo and and particular elections because of how they were reported here uh, and, um, you know, so there's a lot of historical detail too. Um, but, but really it's, it's fundamentally about, um, the U S pressure on Venezuela, less of a, less of a critique or, a analysis of Chavismo, which other, other left writers have done. So Justin, you know, I'm curious, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. Um, and I think it's really cool that you guys kind of use Venezuela. It's like a case study of the sort of hybrid warfare um, like you mentioned, the different tools that the U.S. has to to go about its war making, us everything aside from an actual like U.S. full out invasion with like soldiers on the ground, everything aside from that, the U.S. has basically done to Venezuela. Um, and I think the human rights aspect is really interesting, and I really want to, I do want to get into that the way that human rights groups are weaponized mm -hmm. as well as like different civil society groups because Venezuela is an excellent case study yeah. in that. It's something the U.S. does in countries all around the world, as we all know. Um, but I actually like, before we even get into that, I really like you to kind of lay out the why. Um, because yes, the U.S. like come, came up with this bullshit framework about Venezuela is an extraordinary threat when it obviously does not actually pose a threat to the U.S. However, I would argue that Venezuela does pose an extraordinary threat to the interests of U.S. elites, right? And that's what this is essentially about, um, is the system that, that Venezuela put in place, if it actually worked, um, that could be a huge threat for the U.S. grip over the region. So I guess, can you talk a little bit about what is the actual threat? Why does Venezuela get treated that way? And I know that might sound like a really like simple sort of beginner question, but sometimes I think we talk so much about what the U.S. does, we forget like why it's doing it. Yeah, yeah. So to answer that question, we have to go to what Chavismo is and what the Chavista strategy was, right? So Chavez, you know, in 1998, Chavez comes to power, but then shortly afterwards, there's a pink tide, right? I mean, 94, there was the Zapatista rebellion. So, uh, you know, and Aristide is also, you know, 90, the early 90s to like, I guess he comes back 95. So there's like things happening in the hemisphere uh, from that point. And, and Chavez could, you know, you could understand Chavez is one of them. Um, Brazil, you know, Lula comes to power, I think, in 2002, but like uh, the the worker party had won a, a state government, I think, before that. So there's this, there's, you know, in Argentina, I, I think, um, you know, they had this currency crisis and they had a, a whole big series of movements, piqueteros, and, and they had a whole bunch of things were going on in Latin America. Um, at that time. And so Chavismo was was just one of those things. And there was like 
uh, Chavista strat, you know, you could think of like the Zapatistas had this whole idea that they were going to change the world without taking power. And, you know, there's a debate like they wanted to take power, right? <laughs> they, 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 uh, they, they were, they had a, their initial communique said, we're going to march on Mexico City. And then, you know, it, it kind of changed a little bit. But, um, uh, theory, you know, Latin America kind of political theorists were like, oh, the Zapatistas have shown this way to like agitate for change as an indigenous movement. And then Chavez is like, we're going to we're going to get elected. We're going to use the electoral me mechanisms uh, as well as the army <laughs> to defend it. But like we're going to use the electoral mechanisms. We're going to use the army and we're going to uh, change the laws and we're going to use the laws and we're going to use the new constitution to press for our rights and, and organize for um, for changes, you know, for economic, um, you know, benefits to the people and like, a, you know, kind of like a welfare state system, uh, benefiting from the oil education, you know, we'll, if the if the local doctors don't want to help, then we'll have we'll we'll get Cubans to come, which is what they did. So horrible, just sounds yeah. like really scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very scary stuff, right? Cubans, Cubans everywhere, all of a sudden, <laughs> like you can't you can't you can't like make the people sick enough to to back out off, right? By going on strike as doctors or like. Um, so they substitute these these professionals from Cuba. Um, that's domestically. But then Chavez was also like, look, there's there's things happening. You know, we're not going to, you know, he and he always talks about Simon Bolivar, who was like the person who fought these wars of independence for uh, South America, for Colombia and Peru and, and Bolivia and Venezuela. Uh, and and he always goes back to Bolivar and, and he had all these um ideas of of like how Bolivar dreamed of like an America that was integrated that was strong enough to stand up you know to the United States and like be truly independent and sovereign and he was starting to build these links so he you know Chavez wanted to create this um Alba the the Bolivarian kind of area like an economic um, you know, an economic integration. There was, uh, you know, when the when when Aristide was overthrown in 2004, Chavez, um, you know, was one of the only countries and one of the first to be like, we have an obligation to defend the Haitian Revolution. Um, it was it's it's sovereignty, it's it's economic redistribution, and it's Latin American integration. Um, and all of those things and and Chavez was also a very, very, you know, um, he was very good at um, at talking directly to the people and like, you know, what you might call media strategy, but it's a lot more sincere. It's not like branding and media strategy and marketing. It's like he he would go on TV for eight hours at a time and like answer anybody's, you know, calls and like talk about what he was reading and talk about all, you know, it would be interspersed, you know, he'd talk politics, but he would talk about like, you know, just how to, you know, how to do things, you know, where you can get your, your benefits, where you can get your subsidized food or like a whole bunch of things. And he was just always there. He's always on TV, right? He's always on the radio. He's always at a rally. And so all of these things are what um, the capacity to mobilize people, the agenda of, of uh, South, uh, you know, South, South solidarity and Latin American integration, um, the ability to respond, the ability to kind of give the people a voice uh, so that the monopoly of propaganda is broken, the ability to use professionals from Cuba and, and other places so that the um, so that the monopoly of, of you know, right wing professional classes is broken. And the, and then, of course, using the oil. Right. So when Ven when oil prices were high. Uh, Venezuela had all the all this, you know, extra money and they used it to help uh, Haiti. They used it to help Cuba. Um, they used it, you know, in all these all these ways that that make it very hard, that made it very hard for the U.S. to use monopolies to choke and, and destroy the un undermine these projects. Right. So in a way, like what we what we say about China, what China is doing in Africa, where you know, the US or Europe would like to have this total monopoly on on development projects that they can say, like, you know, you, you either go with us or you uh, on you either take this shitty deal or you get nothing. And China comes along and gives them a better deal, um, you know. Uh, so Venezuela was was doing that mostly in the Americas. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, 
I think that that's, you know, that's why the US just continuously ratcheted that up. And, and, you know, again, like Venezuela's notable because it's survived so long, right? Like they overthrew, they successfully overthrew the Workers' Party in Brazil. They had the coup in 2016. They, um, yeah. you know, the Argentina re reverted back to a right wing mm -hmm. government. You know, they overthrew Haiti. They overthrew Paraguay. I mean, you know, Honduras. They, they like annihilated know, the, they annihilated the pink tide except yeah. for Venezuela. Yeah. So, so that, that's, I guess that's the answer is just like what, how many good, all the good things they were doing um, is why they had to be destroyed. Enjoying. Hello everyone. Hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. Here is a reminder to support our show and help us keep going. You can go to Patreon or Rockfin or Spotify to support our show. So here's the links. If you want to support us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure. If you want to support us on Rockfin and become a subscriber of our channel, go to rockfin.com slash unauthorized dis. And if you'd like to support us on Spotify, pull up our show, the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast, and subscribe to our paid content. On all three spaces, you get access to full episodes and any other additional exclusive content we post every month. So thank you. And Back to the show. But you, the idea of the once prosperous uh, uh, Venezuela, um, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a very good one for them because, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like cute. They do it with, they do it with other countries too, right? Like they do it with Cuba. Like people, people will, I think it was Chomsky that pointed out, like, you shouldn't, you, you're not compare, like, you don't compare Cuba to the U.S., and say, oh, look at all the stuff that the that Cuba doesn't have that the U.S. has. You should compare Cuba to Jamaica, like Cuba to Haiti. Those are the those are the relevant like comparisons. It's a Caribbean island. Uh, compare it to the Caribbean islands that are under U.S. control, and that's what right. that's that's what what you'll see. And and like Venezuela, you know, I go several you know we go we go quite a bit into the comparisons between venezuela and colombia because they're so close they're historically you know they were part of the same country they were liberated at the same time um they are culturally very similar at you know the ethnic um you know the indigenous peoples the the afro uh colombian afro venezuelan people like there, there's so many similarities right um, and the differences between what goes on in Colombia as far as enforced disappearances, mass displacement. And it's like, it's like that story that they, 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 they also do this everywhere where what they're doing in Colombia is what they say is happening in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, you Projection. know, yeah. It's like, like when they say, like when they say Israel, you know, Palestinians teach their children to hate or whatever. And it's because Israel. And Israelis are literally yeah. like on video telling their children to hate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, so the once prosperous thing uh, with Venezuela, it's like before Chavez, um, from like I think it was from at least the fifties, the Venezuelan politics were were ruled in the most corrupt way through this pact called Punto Fijo. Like, um, I think that was the name of a town, but it's kind of a funny name because it means like fixed point. Like it was, it was a power share. I mean, you know, from Lebanon, it's like a power sharing agreement between these two parties, uh, mm -hmm. Acción Democrática and the Christian, uh, like, so there's Christian and, and, uh, whatever liberal. And they, and they had like a deal to alternate the presidency. They had a deal to, you know, share power across the, uh, legislature and the executive. So it was just totally like the, 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 the total lack of even a, a pretense of democracy. And then throughout the 60s and 70s, there were guerrilla movements in, in Venezuela and uh, as elsewhere. And and those guerrillas and their families were subjected, you know, and the, and the whole villages were subjected to these terror, you know, terror campaigns, disappearances, torture in prisons, all of that. Um, and, and then in the 80s, you know, there was this like a really, really brutal particularly brutal uh, neoliberal restructuring which uh where they overnight um tripled or multiplied the the price of bus fare 
like by some Damn. crazy amount. So like people got up in the morning and they went to the bus and the bus fare was 10 times what it was. Uh, and so they, you know, they, they did what people do and they flipped the bus over. Right? Like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go. So that, that, that was like an urban rebellion called the Caracaso where, um, in 1989, and, and that was also like brutally repressed, you know, they shot mm -hmm. lots of people in the streets, huge massacres. And Chavez was of course, um, a military officer at that time. So Chavez was like, we, I'm never going to do anything like this again. Um, you know, and, and kind of had an analysis that this this uh, was what this led to. So again, all of which is to say once prosperous uh, is ridiculous. Like it's, <laughs> it's once once uh, corrupt, once, um, you know, and then and then like if you think of all the things that Chavez had to do in terms of like the literacy rates, in terms of infant mortality, in terms of all the things that were trending really, really nicely until the sanctions were were tightened. Um, and now, of course, you have tens of thousands of preventable deaths uh, because of the sanctions. But but all of those outcomes were were drastically improved from a baseline of, you know, you know, outrageously high, um, you know, in mortality rates and, and outrageously bad uh, health outcomes and, and nutritional outcomes uh, for the majority of the country while you know once prosperous is true because in periods of uh in periods of of high oil prices uh there was a you know the oil company was prosperous right and that was like that was part of the scandal that was part of what chavez was saying like we have the money here you know we have this oil the state oil company um that controls so much of the whole economy and so much of the foreign exchange of the country. And we need to bring that under popular control. And like the struggle over the oil company, PDVSA, was like, has been the struggle of Chavismo for, you know, like arguably the whole time. So yeah, uh, it was, yeah. So that's why like, it takes a little bit of, of going into Venezuelan history to debunk this once prosperous. Um, but we have the charts, you know, we have the data, we can, you can look, you can see when it was prosperous and when people were doing better. Uh, and, and those were actually the, the golden years of Chavismo, right? Like 2006, 2007, um, you know, when the policies had started to take fruit and, you know, they had defeated some of the major coup attempts and uh, and then before they really started, the U.S. really started to tighten the sanctions. It's so funny to me um, when people I, I love the comparison you made. I never thought about it that way, where it's like, no, we should be comparing these countries to the U.S. backed governments in the region, in which case, mm -hmm. like Venezuela is way more democratic and you can't it doesn't even compare yeah. to what's happening in Colombia. But more than that, it's like so funny to me when they say, oh, the once prosperous of these countries, because like, especially with like Cuba yeah. or, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you mean when there was like no one could read and there was yeah. like a U.S. backed dictatorship that just like killed people in the streets yeah. or like China again, when like the yeah. like the people died at the age of 35 before yeah. the revolution in China. You ever um, read that? You ever read that book Fan Shen? It's like this mm -mm. this guy, William Hinton, he was like he was hanging out in China like before and during the revolution. And he he kind of wrote like he wrote it almost like a documentary. But there's like a chapter at the beginning where if you were a peasant in China, you had to go to the bathroom on the landlord's um, property, like in the landlord's toilet, because he had a right to your uh, night soil. Uh, like you, you didn't even have a right because that that's like the fertilizer, right? So like, you you didn't even have the. Well, we have to go back to the era of democracy in <laughs> yeah. China when people yeah. had to like get the landlord's permission to take a piss. <laughs> it's, just so, it's just so that the, that framing is so absurd, and then it's also the other thing too is like, and this is more than just a comment than a question. The other thing too is they always make, and this actually is a good. Um, is a good segue to the question I want to ask you, but they make this really big deal about like uh, taking the kinds of political freedoms we have in the U.S. or that we think we have in the U.S. where we can just like shout obscenities at the president if we want to and nothing's going to happen to us. Um, 
you know, and they're like, can you do that in Cuba? You know, like, can you like, you know, can you draw mean pictures and, and like say awful things about the leadership? And I actually think you can, but you can do more and you can do 10 times more in Venezuela yeah. than you can do in the U S we're right. in Venezuela, obviously. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> if it really was a dictatorship, then like Juan Guaido should be dead. Guaido like, is walking around. He's walking around free. Like if somebody in America tried to do to the u.s government what juan guaido has tried to do to the venezuelan government colluding with a foreign power to try to literally overthrow it they would be in prison for like for like treason or something so the, the but but like the point is to say that um you know we also don't ever get when we talk about the rights that we have versus I, I'm using Cuba because Venezuela does actually have a lot of the rights. We say, wait, they, they don't have, yeah. but maybe Cuba isn't, isn't, um, you know, it is like this kind of like one party state. So fine. But at the same time, like in Cuba, they have like a right to housing. It's like considered yeah. a right um, and a right to healthcare. And like, those aren't considered rights in the U S so who's really free here. But the point is to say the weaponization of human rights and the whole human rights industry, whether it's like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, all of these like civil society groups that are essentially funded by either American oligarchs through their various foundations that are very closely aligned with American foreign policy interests, or in some cases, directly by U.S. government affiliated organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, but yeah, can you talk about the way, because I think this has been one of the most uh, crucial ways that the U S has been able to demonize Venezuela in the U S and that's by weaponizing human rights, even though it's mostly based on BS. Yeah. But can you talk a bit, a bit about this tool in the sort of like regime change toolbox is the weaponization yeah. of human rights and the organizations behind it? Yeah. I got a lot out of this book, uh, by James Peck, uh, called ideal so illusions. Yeah. I'm reading that right now. Yeah. It's you so good. That. Yeah. So, so he to. talks about like how um, you they they developed this specifically as an anti-communist politics because they were like communism has these things people like right like how <laughs> like you were saying like they're gonna feed everybody and everybody's yeah. gonna read and like everybody's gonna have some land like how do we compete with that and then yeah. and then they're like well we're gonna compete with that by like you know we can't just compete with that by saying anti we're anti that right? yeah so they were like anti-communism isn't good enough we need to have like rights rights and democracy so rights and democracy becomes this thing and then they have like the way that americans do things is like they quantify it and they have these reports and like you know uh but they they get into like the details of the law so you know with human rights watch it's it's incredible because it's like the way they the way they define um the way they define things in these legal terms, like they're not against aggression. So that's not an issue. Aggression is not a rights issue. They're not against war per se. Um, you know, they're not against sanctions per se. They're just like, please do your sanctions in a way that doesn't hurt civilians or, or <laughs> cause undue hardship. Right. And that, like, that's like when Israel's bombing Gaza and they're just like killing all these children Human Rights Watch never says, hey, don't bomb Gaza. They always say, we know you have to do this, but like, please do this in a way that that doesn't cause disproportionate harm, right? Because that's like, those are the moments where human rights organizations really expose themselves because um, if you're if you're paying attention, because mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. when like you, they show they don't really give a shit about this. They're just, um, they're, they create this, this system that guarantees that, anybody who's resisting is going to look bad according to this, these rules and anybody that's doing things like the, the imperialists that just do what they do, which is like starve people, uh, bomb people. Well, that's just, that's like part of life. It's like the weather or something. So with, with, you know, again, with Palestine, it's like a lot of what they do is like, they have this intent thing, right? So it's like, well, Israel, kills all the kills hundreds of Palestinians when they attack them, but they're not trying to, whereas the rockets that Hamas fires or whatever, Qassam fires, they are trying to kill civilians. So it's like, but you you human rights watch is like apparently in the minds of Palestinians and Israelis to be able to determine intent. But like they have to have intent because if they went by effect, 
imperialists, you know, kill 10 or 100 times more people than pe those that resist them. So they can't go by a fact. They can't, they're not against aggression in principle. They're not against sanctions in principle. They don't designate Chelsea Manning as a prisoner of conscience. They don't, uh, you know, do anything for Assange, right? So um, the, the way that they do this is they have these campaigns where, you know, someone like, you know, Bolivia is a great example where they'll, they'll campaign for these prisoners who are actual criminals who are yeah. you know and then they're like these people's rights are being violated and it's like they're they're they've been they committed crimes that they, they killed people yeah <laughs> they were tried and then they were punished what like what did you think was gonna happen like Incredible. so um so yeah so but with human rights watch the other thing the other trick with um with venezuela specifically is um they they campaign uh very re like relentlessly around every little change that venezuela does so it'll be like even a kind of a change in the broadcast licenses they'll be like we're very concerned about free speech <laughs> in venezuela right and it'll be like your license expired <laughs> like yeah. it'll be some private networks license that expired and they're like we're gonna give that license to somebody else you know they're um, like super concerned about also like you mentioned with the prisoners they're doing it with nicaragua now where they're like yeah. really concerned about people who committed crimes having been jailed yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. i'd say this person like burned on a clinic and like killed somebody and yeah. they're in prison or um but so, sorry i didn't mean to like break into there it's just no. the other thing that gets me too is like what you're talking about they do that with cnn i just wanted to throw that in there they do that with cnn where like CNN actually actively participates in Venezuela and trying to destabilize the country, CNN Espanol. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if even like an official in Venezuela speaks out about that, they like call that like intimidation. Yeah. And we'll be like, <laughs> yeah. oh, Venezuela yeah. doesn't have a free press. Like, right, right. It's intimidation if anybody says anything. But like, the so the other, the thing we do again in that chapter, we call it the human rights fraud. Um, is we we just track like the number of people killed by the opposition, you know, and and Chavistas there there were some there were some there were clashes where Chavistas killed people, but almost almost all of the time it's like people shooting at each other, you know, and and when people shoot at each other, it's you know it happens that people die, but it's not like it's not like Colombia where you have these like motorcycle assassinations of of unionists or peasant leaders. Uh, happening all the time so it's just it, like it's it's uh there's like a legal framework where people are are sought out and punished according to the law and and you know in one case there was like a prosecutor that was that was assassinated right like a venezuelan prosecutor that was um going after some of these uh criminals that was he was assassinated himself so there's like a lot of um there's a lot of it, the way that human rights uh, organizations work is like if if the U.S. kind of does these CIA dirty tricks things, there's no evidence to tie them to any of it. So it'll be like there'll be this assassination program going on. There'll be this sabotage going on. And of course, none of those are human rights issues. But if you catch somebody and you put them in jail for doing those things, that's a human rights issue because that's happening in the open and nobody denies that it's happening. So it's just a, it's a, it's a framework. It's a, it's a game that's rigged against anyone who's resisting the empire because it's like a set of rules that they have to follow, which is also how like, you know, the international criminal court has only ever prosecuted black people and, um, and African leaders and like just ruled to exclude us crimes from its Afghanistan probe. So it's like, you know, when they feel like simply excluding the U.S., they also will just do that. Mm -hmm. So continuing with this case study, I'd like to play just the trailer for this propaganda film that was oh, put HBO. out by, by HBO. I mean, just I, oh, I, have I imagine this. I have <laughs> not watched this. So this okay. is this is this is my first time watching this trailer. Right. Um, I'll, I'll just bring it in here. And then I'll get your reaction. Obviously, I'm not asking. I don't. You didn't watch the film. You let no. Joe did. I let you, Joe. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> you let somebody else do it for their own torture. 
and uh but and now you're gonna subject us all to it now well this is just a trailer but i suppose it could be like a microaggression so i don't apologize <laughs> Am I, I have like trigger warning oh no yeah mm. here we go um okay so let's uh make this close. i'm nervous guys <laughs> <laughs> i'm a little bit nervous i'm feeling attacked i'm feeling attacked. i feel i do i feel sorry okay More than I'm already 3 million annoyed. refugees, an economy in freefall. Venezuela is crumbling under the weight of Maduro's oppressive uh... regime. Okay. Are you honestly saying there is no hunger in Venezuela? Yo le digo que ustedes han montado un estereotipo de una Venezuela que no existe. Es simplemente que esto es una dictadura. Univision. Rainbow. Is this like PR? Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Listeners can't see the images, but it's just showing how mean the government is and how brave the protesters are. Oh my god. We're saying yes, we can. It's like, the same, <laughs> it's like the same shots over and over again. Yeah, it is. It's not very creative. Um, this is just okay, someone's so, did this is propaganda for Juan Guaido oh, and for okay, the whole so, Venezuelan yeah. opposition. Wow. Uh, did you see this part of the the yeah, they keep refugees and so hold on, I'm trying free... to find the, the, show the, the there, look, the truck. Show, isn't this the truck that they <laughs> yeah that they burned oh that's really they funny their own yeah they so, burned their for those who are for those who can't see who are only listening they are as actually a shot uh as the b-roll goes by of like the brave protesters where they're at the colombian border literally burning the aid trucks that the u.s was trying to force in as like a propaganda <laughs> kind of coup uh, a couple of years ago um, and then it turns out we later found out even the New York Times confirmed that it was actually the pro the opposition protesters who burned the trucks and they show a fucking image of them burning the aid truck. Oh my god. Yeah, well Im Christ. that's the way images work, right? It's just like you know, they have images, they have music, and they just show like people oh my god. chanting and you so this film uh that is terrible is called alakala i realized a calle. That I didn't a la calle. I didn't... to the streets a, a, la, a la calle yeah for, yeah. for uh, the gringo <laughs> over here so unless you're in chile or colombia then please don't go to the streets and if you do don't you go get to the killed. streets you can get we're killed we're literally gonna say nothing yeah. we're not gonna well, say the, anything well and the other criticism is that those are the uh you can correct me on the pronunciation but the, uh, isn't it the the, the garimbas that, yeah the, yeah. the garim and that's what they're basically showing in yeah, the yeah. in the uh trailer for this film uh which you know as we see Basically, is that nexus that that media human rights organization nexus? Those are the people that are pushing this film to HBO. So if you wanna if you wanna see a film about the Guarimbas, yeah. I watch Abby Martin's film about the yeah. Guarimbas, right? That you'll see the same foot if you like that footage. You'll see the same footage. <laughs> you'll, just see it, you'll see it placed in a different context. Abby was get, there. It gets your pulse pounding, and, and that's the a kind of thrill. It's <laughs> incredible, though. It really is incredible to me how relentless the propaganda is, though. Like it's unending. It is constant. It is. I can't get away from it. You can't get away from it in any part of our culture yep. whether it's like some new netflix series or whether it's like a show that has nothing to do with anything somehow they'll yep. somehow they'll insert like anti-chavez stuff and like i remember the good wife had an episode oh, where they just God. completely mocked chavez and made him sound like an insane crazy dictator oh, and i'm like you're not even about international stuff like why are you doing this and I, I saw there's... clips from a community or something. There's like a show about a community college and there was like a Venez it was a comedy. And then there was like a Venezuelan delegation and they came in oh, military God. uniform. And, you know, you yeah, know how they, all, do... they always walk around in military. <laughs> the only around Venezuelans in military, uniform. Exist in the military uniform. <laughs> there's also like, 
Um, even in my Instagram feed sometimes, like I just like follow random celebrities sometimes because I'm like that. Um, and I'm not really on Instagram that much, but like every once in a while when I do open my Instagram feed, like I'll see posts by random celebrities and they're not usually political because it's celebrities. And there's this one pop star who's actually Cuban American and she's like Cam a really Is it Camilla Ca yeah Cabello? and she like to she like has been repeatedly performing that song that was like created by the americans uh she left she her heart and she left her heart in havana right she left yeah, her heart in havana. havana well that song wasn't really political right like this but then like she's like she like came out like sos cuba uh, and like suddenly like there's all these posts in my feed sos cuba by this massive celebrity has just like millions and millions of views and likes <laughs> But then if, anyway. if, if we're going to talk about Camila Cabello um, being, you know, anti Chavez, we should also mention that she like she was also canceled. Right. Because she had a whole bunch of anti black racist tweets when she Did was. She? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should, you should check that, that out. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> just just say that's it. funny because now <laughs> maybe there's a connection. Portrays, she definitely like a lot of these younger um, Hollywood people. And they really they, they see obviously maybe some of them agree with it or not but they do see i think a benefit to sort of getting on the progressive train of like being pro black lives matter being tro pro lgbtq rights and all these things so you'll see them doing that it's more for pr i think than anything they really give a shit about um but they're kind of like creating these personas because it's good for their brand that yeah. they're pro anti like they're in the, no, that's a stupid pro anti racism that they are anti racist that they're yeah. like you know pro equality and then they throw this shit in but she also performed the reason i even brought her up is because yesterday it was in my feed she like performed that that key that uh song the the bullshit protest song that was like created yeah. in a ned laboratory <laughs> she performed it at like the latin billboard awards so like it's just everything everything hbo hollywood like your like your stupid tv show to just like walking on the street it's just in your face you can't escape it it's such extreme propaganda to convince americans that these horrific policies that are killing people are actually good mm -hmm. and actually helping people it's well, amazing and, and it's funny too because because it does conflict with their anti-racism it's just like it's like a lot of things right because like camila cabello wants to like you said like be cool and and you know she she was she posted a bunch of racist stuff because she must have grown up in a racist anti-cuban family like yeah, a, the right-wing cuban together. family in florida yeah. right and it's like the 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 venezuelan opposition like the anti-chavez opposition is super racist like super 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 racist like they they let they they killed someone like lit him on fire he wasn't a chavista but they were the the mob was like we think he's a chavista because he's black and chavistas mm -hmm. are black so they're like targeting people for being black on this like political grounds because you know like you can imagine more poor black people therefore more chavistas like it's a it, there's just kind of these kinds of connections are not hard to make right um but yeah there so you're supporting you're supporting in venezuela the most racist political formations in the country in the name of whatever whatever this is uh a la calle or you know whatever you're singing about so it's it's um it's crude joe joe um joe's joe the title of joe's if you want to if you want to read a debunking of this uh of this um film joe emersberger my co-author he wrote uh, a thing in in fairness and accuracy and reporting a week a week and a half ago called hbo's anti-maduro propaganda is cruder than venezuelan oil <laughs> okay it's a, it's a bit of a dad joke but like uh, I, I, it's I good can't. it's good i like <laughs> it I, I like it so we've talked about like the human rights aspect we've talked about like, i think the, i think the biggest issue now when it comes to venezuela is the issue of sanctions and i think that that right now you're talking about the tools talking about the what of the how um <laughs> is the, the the biggest tool in the american toolbox right now to really try to bully its adversaries and get its way is economic warfare and what's amazing is like you can literally open any article in an American mainstream outlet about Venezuela, and it's always Venezuela's in crisis, something's wrong with the government, abuses, yada, yada, like people are hungry. 
And if you're lucky in like the 17th or 18th paragraph, they'll (laughs) mention that U.S. sanctions may have contributed to this problem. So I guess, can you talk about just how devastating this economic warfare has been on the country of Venezuela? Yes, it's still standing. Yes, it's like has this partnership that's really, I think, amazing with Iran, which is a country on the other side of the world that the only thing that's really brought Iran and Venezuela together is that they're both like desperate to get around U.S. sanctions that are crushing their economies. Um, but, you know, uh, and you talked about all of these gains that the that Chavismo made for people when it came to literacy and education and health and these kinds of things that you saw the sort of peak of in the 2000s. Um, but then what happened? Like, because there is, right? There are, like, the quality of life in Venezuela has deteriorated. There's this massive hyperinflation. People can't afford things. Their salaries are worthless. And it's only getting worse. And that's why people have left the country. It's basically economic refugees who are, like, leaving to try to work in Colombia or, like, wherever they can get to try to, like, make a living. Um, so can you talk about, I guess, just, like, what the mainstream leaves out? And I know it's, again, this is maybe very obvious, but I want to get into it. Like, what have sanctions done to this country? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so j- just before before we get into that, just to say, like, the mo- I'd say it's true that they hide it, but in some ways, like, and Joe is the one who points this out, most often it's like the most monstrous argument they make about the sanctions is when they say Venezuela would have been poor anyway you know those people would have died anyway so it's like it's like you you know I've never, jo- that's actually made I'm sorry I've never even heard yeah, that you argument. hear that all the time you know the officials do it they do it in the media and and Joe is just like so you go into the hospital and you shoot someone who's dying of cancer and you're like they were gonna die anyway you know, like that's that's the that's the moral level of this argument. Right. But like um, there's there we cite a report again from years ago and like things have only gotten worse and the sanctions have only gotten tighter since then. But like from years ago, a couple of years ago now, uh, there was a there was a study where they estimated 40,000 people um had died because of the sanctions right and it's like again it's like preventable disease where they can't get medicine or cancer treatment or uh um it's like um yeah it's a lot of medicine like a lot of the issue is medicine right and they're doing better now with vaccine you know again like as soon as the pandemic started i i wrote this tweet where i was like even with sanctions venezuela is going to handle this better than a lot of capitalist uh countries and and I knew because they just like they have a system where people can check in on each other and where people, you know, can they can tell you to lock down and they can feed you while you're under lockdown and they have Cuban doctors and they have good advice. Right. They're not going to just open up and let people die the way they did in Brazil, for example, or uh, elsewhere. Um, so uh they have these things going for them, but they can't you know, the economy is not. <clears throat> And Cuba has the same problem. Like, if you figure out a way to make a, a, a medicine with, say, three chemical inputs, the U.S. is tr- always trying to figure out how to take one or one or one or more of those inputs away. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's always this race of like, they try to take something away, and then the the Venezuelans or the Cubans under sanctions try to adapt. But there's also the you know what we saw with Meng Wanzhou or or um, you know, anybody that does business with a sanctioned country also gets in trouble. So that's the big, that's the big danger, right? It's not like, it's not, in some cases, it's, um, it's not like there's a hard blockade. It's more like people trying to do business with you that supply, you know, chemicals or oil, um, oil rig spare parts, right? Like, it's like advanced technical machinery for which there are not that many suppliers in the world. And then you have to figure out a way to get those parts um, and knowing that the person, the company that sells them to you is going to get in, is going to get in trouble for doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing with Iran is like Iran and Venezuela have a deal now to um, where Iran is going to try to fix some of the stuff that they have, like, like running those machines, it's constant maintenance and it's constant, um, it's constant upkeep and it's constant repair. And so if you can't, if you don't have the parts coming in all the time, um, you can't, you can't keep an oil industry running. Um, So they have like a longer term plan to get production 
going again. Uh, but in the and then if once they once they can produce again, of course, they have the problem of how to sell it because the U.S. tries to stop everybody from buying it. Uh, so it's just like every imagine like every door that you go to to try to do all the daily thing. Like you know, we 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 have it in our daily lives, but as a government, it's like you're trying to procure you know, you're trying to procure these things through contracts. I mean, again, like Lebanon is a great um, example, right? Like they're just shutting every door down mm -hmm. to try to bring you to your knees so that you give them whatever they want. And instead you're being really clever and you're trying to go around it, but like, like things fall through the cracks, people die. Like, and when things, when something falls through the cracks, people die. Like I remember talking to a doctor uh, about like Gaza and he's like, yeah, you're, you're like talking about Gaza um, you know, and people who are dying in the bombing, but it's like, there are people in the hospital who uh, are on dialysis. And if the power goes out and the dialysis machine doesn't run, those people die, they just die. Mm -hmm. So it's like, did the bombing kill them? No. But like, and is it a human rights watch issue? No, human rights watch doesn't give a shit. But like, those are like all people who die because the economy, you know, the so called economy isn't working. Um, from, from because of the sanctions, right? So, and then like the scale of it, right? Like, um, you know, m there's medicine, but really like the issue is revenue too, right? Like a bigger issue than specific medicines or machine parts is, is the inability to sell their oil and the inability to get legitimate revenue for their oil. Um, and that's, you know, that w when Venezuela was once prosperous, uh, <laughs> that, uh, they were a one industry country right and like again Chavez mm -hmm. was trying to diversify that create some food security some agricultural um you know they have good land Chavez was always trying to argue like you know we don't need to eat hamburgers and fries from America we can eat yeah. arepas and beans whatever but like the point is um that that it's it's the inability to sell the the inability to get uh, the oil revenue that that means you know they're trying to do it run an administration with hardly any money um and that's why like all this stuff that you were talking about with inflation and the exchange rates and all these things that that start to happen when you're trying to do things with no money and and you know your currency is tied to the international trade system so you can't just print you can you have some freedom but you can't just print money or you'll you'll create hyperinflation so it's um it's that um if yeah and and, and like none of that is None of, yeah, it's hard to say, like, no, I, I want to say, I, I, I'm going to say something like stupid and liberal and naive, but it's like, none of that is justifiable, even in terms of regime change, right? Like, right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like, it's not going to re it's not, you're not going to get a regime change out of it, which you're just going to, you're just going to create this, this misery issue of what could create a crisis of legitimacy for this project against Venezuela. I mean, I kind of want to invite you, I, I suppose it requires a bit of misplaced optimism and, but I don't want you to stray from reality. Like in truth, we've had these moments or there was a, there was a, it was a blip, but it's something that the Biden administration had to manage mm -hmm. recently. And I know you've done work looking at Haiti and the, the impact of empire. And there was, and it may have passed and it, it, it in the end, it may just be a momentary, but uh, last month they had to deal with an actual official resigning and not being willing to be a part of this project anymore. Although his objection was, you know, more complex than straightforward. I, I, I picked up on the fact that he, uh, this this person, Daniel Foote, who was uh, a, a diplomat, was upset that there was seemingly not enough going into uh, law enforcement or policing against gangs in Haiti, but also objected to the mass deportations of, of Haitians back to their own countries and raised extreme concerns about the fact that the United States government is not letting people pick their leaders in Haiti, that they're actually interfering in the electoral process of Haiti. And that was not reported when covering that resignation. So when you look at that project, that imperial project there in Haiti, you see that there are cracks in the fixture. And part of it is, uh, part of the reason why I think those cracks appear is because you have these natural occurring events in which people are suffering in mass, like the earthquakes, or whether you're talking about a hurricane, and, and people believe that 
there should be humanitarian aid and that you know nobody should have to suffer from those catastrophes for the most part. And yet when you look at Venezuela, you know, what what could be the thing that maybe provides an opening for people? Because because to the to now, Juan Guaido, the fact that he hasn't actually been able to take power, that would seem to be an opening. That would seem to be something in which you could say to people, uh, this is ridiculous. You can't have somebody going around claiming to be the president of Venezuela. And that should be the, 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 the biggest thing that exposes the farce as well as the tragedy of what is being imposed on Venezuelans. But people have mostly just gone along with it, even though it has its own cartoonish aspects. And so, I mean, what to you do you think could be that thing that helps break this project against Venezuela? I mean, I, I think that's a that you know that's the that's the question. That's the that's the most important question. But I, I I actually think that it's it's in some ways it's starting to happen, and I think the the thing that's starting to happen and and that should be encouraged as much as possible is that these countries trading with each other you know and 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 working with each other and like like the iran venezuela thing you know rania you you said it was um you know they have they have nothing in common but like they were chavez was friendly with iran when it was politically costly for him um in the early 2000s, you know, there's that famous picture of him like yeah, uh, hugging yeah. Ahmadinejad, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the yeah. but, 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 but why, right? It's because they're two yeah. global south countries that stand up to like the big bully. Yeah, yeah, right? but it's like it's like you know, back then there were lots of like you know, lots of these leftists that are like, oh, why are you hugging Ahmadinejad? He's so bad, right? And it's like, well, now you know, I'm like totally not cool with Ahmadinejad because he's had like a liberal turn. <laughs> Yes. Right. Oh my God, he yeah. has. He's such, well, he's he got he on Twitter, a Twitter, you know. If Chavez was on Twitter, who knows what would have happened? All the hardliners in Iran, which is like not the best word to use, but like all the pro-revolutionary people in Iran are like can't stand him anymore because he's turned into such a liberal. <laughs> and now it was so funny because um, during the recent Iranian elections, he was like disqualified from running, and it was so weird to see the Americans were like so upset. They were like, "This is not democratic." How You're dare not you? Really I'm like, didn't you guys call? this guy like the source of all he was like hitler the second coming like 10 years ago or whatever anyway it's just funny how that things change but anyways i i yeah. your point is well taken though i guess what i meant is just like iran and venezuela are on two opposite sides of the world they don't no. really have a reason to be doing trade with each other it's just not like logistically yeah. practical uh and they are though because the u.s is like cutting both of them off from the international yeah economy and not allowing them to sell their own oil and they can actually benefit from each other so in a way it's funny the u.s brings its adversaries together with its policies like in yes. a way that they otherwise wouldn't be so it's like it becomes a question of like what is the u.s source of power like sure they have the they have this incredible military they spend way more than everybody else on their military everybody else combined but it's like it's also the fact that everybody like does business through the u.s and it's and every and a lot of people want to do business through the U.S. So like the in some ways, like the biggest weapon that that the U.S. has is these groups of people in each of these countries, like the Venezuelans that are so pro U.S. and the Cubans that are so pro U.S. and the Iranians that are like Ahmadinejad now, apparently, <laughs> which I didn't know about. But it's like if and then and then it's not just like they maybe they hate themselves, but they also hate those other countries. And so like as if if these connections uh continue where it's like russia like all these like one third or half the countries of the world are under some kind of sanctions now right so if the us gets in this position where they're sanctioning more and more of the world they'll sanction a block of countries that have everything that that you need where it's like you know you're yeah. sanctioning russia china venezuela cuba um iran that's a pretty, you know, you can get almost anything, you know, like yeah. they have doctors, like you... <laughs> you know, they have oil, they have food, you know, they have You're, like, you're sanctioning all these, all these like global South countries that you literally like are sanctioning because they won't give you their resources for yeah. free. 5G, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that, and, and then like, as if sanctions become less effective, Kevin, like then you'll see more people in the in the US elite being like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do these anymore on principle, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it, there's the, there's always this kind of like these connections where 
you know, they'll make indirect arguments. They'll never say this is wrong on principle, but they will start to defect from something that isn't working anyway, I hope. Well, and then there's these ex there's these exile communities, right? And I also think that sometimes they can be their own worst enemy because there are really ugly aspects of their own communities that come out. And you'll see those, like, let's just take like the right-wing Venezuelan community. You'll see in Florida how it doesn't mesh well with the liberal cosmopolitan yeah. nature of the United States. And, and then it, I don't know if it really is a drag on the policy toward Venezuela, but I don't think it helps them gain more support for right. what they're trying to do. Right. Right. There's always some limit, you know, again, Israel's another example. It's like, it's harder and harder for liberals to, def they try, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll always try, but like, a lot of them just disappear and try not to comment during the worst, uh, worst things. Well, all right, Justin, it's been really good to have you on our show. Uh, do you want to say something about where people can go to find your work? Maybe plug your anti-empire project. And, yeah, yeah, I have a podcast, you guys. This really blew up, y'all. Excellent podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we have a, a, I have the anti-empire project and we do, I, I have like my old high school history teacher, uh, Dave Power, and we go through like, his modern Western civilization history class, but like we're trying to fix it because it was, it's very Euro. It, it's not his fault, but you know, in yeah. high school, you only have so many days. So we're trying to like get the, you know, the rest of the world. And we're on uh, the scramble for Africa now. So if you want to find out what happened nice. when the mm. imperialists, you know, robbed Africa. But by the imperialists, you mean China? When China robbed <laughs> Africa, right? So yeah, thank you for that clarification, <laughs> Rania. I, I, yes, it is an anti China. <laughs> My, my my agenda is uh, yeah, to, when to China and Venezuela and Iran robbed Africa. Yeah, yeah. To bring back the century of humiliation. That's, that's yeah. where I am. Right, right. They, they took over for the Soviet Union, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or maybe I'm watching too many Joy Reid. <laughs> No, but it's an excellent podcast. I, I I really appreciate what you're doing, and you're so good. You actually like you have the podcast voice. Oh, thank you, thank you. Even you're like blessed with it. Uh, can, are, are you, can you guys play this? Um, can you play Camilla singing that song as, like, the, <laughs> as the outro for this? For this oh, but I think it'll get we'll get like a copyright violation, <laughs> yeah. which would be like I, yeah, so I, I wish you could just slide it in there. <laughs> but we post this. I post this through Anchor, and they now give you the ability through Spotify to take songs and oh. put them as like mm -hmm. we we actually could like introduce and then go out. Because if you pick one, I think you have to use the same thing. Uh, oh. They don't give you a lot of functionality uh, because it's free. But uh, but yeah. This. So that would be the only way we could get around the copyright. No, definitely if we just played her song, we'd probably get that. So, so Justin, name your podcast one more time. And then also where can people like follow just you? Oh, so it's the Anti-Empire Project. Um, my website is just my last name, podor.org. So I put blogs and like, articles i had an interview with this uh i had a syria interview with this rania Kalik character like <laughs> 10 years ago or something that did happen people it's still been, useful to this people day, have been yelling at me since then like oh why You're... did you talk to rania Kalik? you <laughs> are welcome justin i'm glad that i could help your career i've often um, heard that i've often heard from people that associating with me is very useful it's, for yeah, their it's, ability it's, just a, to... it's a upward mobility yeah exactly <laughs> Um, and yeah, and Twitter. Twitter is just my la my first and last name, Justin Podor. So at Justin Podor. Yeah. Thanks, guys. This was excellent. Thank you for coming on. This was wonderful. And everybody should also go get your book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be back next week with another show. Thanks, everybody. Once again, here's a reminder to support the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast by going to our Patreon or Rockfin, or finding us on Spotify. On Patreon, we're at patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure. On Rockfin, you can subscribe to our channel at rockfin.com slash unauthorized dis. And on Spotify, all you have to do is find our show, Unauthorized Disclosure, and become a paid subscriber. Thank you for supporting the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast. We'll be back soon.